A number of weeks ago, and as I mentioned to you before, the Lord's been really laying out of what He wants to do from now, actually, all the way through the end of November. And so, a number of weeks ago, the Lord really impressed upon me that He wanted me to share on being a priest of the home. And so, we are going to start a three-week series today called 3D Priest. And in preparation for that, uh, the, the different things that we're covering are going to be discipline, discipleship, and discernment. Those are the three Ds of being priests of the home that we're going to be discussing. And initially, I was going to, to spend an entire week on each D. But as I began to study and prepare for this and was praying for it, I felt I needed to lay some foundation, some groundwork before we get into it because we don't want to assume anything. And so as we began to, to uh, put some things down and research different things, I, I was six pages deep in my notes. <laughs> and I was like, there's no way before I'd even introduced the word discipline yet. There's no way I can do that. So what we're going to do is this week we're going to lay the foundation. We're going to spend next week, Lord willing, things are always subject to change. But as of right now, we're going to spend next week, focus our attention on discipline and the last week on discipleship and discernment. That's how we plan on doing it. So, uh, and I can't go a fourth week because we had other plans moving forward going into November. So uh, we, we have to make sure that we stay on track. So what we're going to look at here is bringing a priest of the home. So this is most certainly without question for all the guys in the house that are married all the guys that aren't married that want to be married in the future, all the young men that have plans of being married someday, um, ladies, it is definitely for you. If you are married to a man that maybe isn't doing these things, this is the expectation that you should have. Maybe you have aspirations of being married someday. This is what you should expect of your soon-to-be or in the future husband or your current husband. And this is what the Lord has designed. These are not my words. This is straight from Scripture, and so I would encourage you today as we are going through this, if you want to take notes, feel free to raise your hand. Carol Lee will give you a bulletin. You can take notes. But let's look in Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22. Ephesians 5, verse 22 says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Have a great week. You are loved. <laughs> oh, wait, there's more. There's more. That was just my favorite part. <laughs> uh. We love to read that part, guys. We love to remind our wives of that. We love to, to read that scripture over. But here's the problem. It doesn't end, the thought doesn't end there. It actually just starts. It is just the, barely the beginning. Let's continue. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, those are some meaty words. We're going to come back to that. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water of the word by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. They should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. Isn't it great to know that the Lord cherishes you? I love that word, cherish. He cherishes the church. For we are members of his body, and of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined with his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each of you, in particular, so love his own wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. It's almost like 
the Holy Spirit knew what we as men and women want. The last verse there says, men, husbands, love your wives and wives respect your husbands. Hmm. Interesting. So that is the base passage we're going to be using over the next three weeks. So let's talk about a few things here. For a lot of men, there are a few terms that are very few terms that are as confusing or intimidating as when someone tells you to be the spiritual leader of your home. What does that even mean, or what does it look like on a daily basis? Today we want to demystify the concept and start leading you toward that this week. If you're married or have children, no doubt you've heard it often, guys. You need to be the priest of your home. You need to be the spiritual leader. What does that mean? Are you supposed to have the Bible memorized? Uh, do you need to always have the right answers? Are you not supposed to ever have any struggles? Even as a pastor, am I supposed to have it all figured out? We had men's group a couple weeks back, and, and uh, each of the guys had gone around and, and shared different things that was going on in their worlds. And at the end, one of them said, hey, Chef, what about you? And I, you know, I said, it, it's difficult sometimes for pastors to be in those type of settings because of the fact that in the moment, some feel very much so, in the moment that you share a struggle or share a weakness, that people are going to all of a sudden feel like, oh, the shine of your, your armor is, there's a kink, and that's garbage. And that's why many Leaders in churches fall into temptation and fall into trouble because of the fact that they won't ask for help. They won't share struggles and challenges that they have because they feel like that you feel like we need to have it all figured out. And they're reminding me that's not the case. So that was very encouraging for me. Back to the spiritual leader. Are you making all the spiritual decisions for your family? What does it look like on a practical day-to-day -day level? So let's clarify this a bit. The truth is that God has entrusted your family to you. He wants you to love and lead them well. And I want to help you to feel equipped to do exactly that, of course, with the Holy Spirit's help. More than anything, and I want to encourage you in everything you do to look to Jesus as our example. We would do very well in our lives if we would pause and do this more frequently. Ask yourself very literally, what would Jesus do in this situation? I know a number of years ago, the bracelets came out, WWJD, and they're very well intended, and, and it kind of became a bit trite. But the premise behind what they're focusing on, the reminder of what would the Lord do in this situation, is a phenomenal thing for us to, to ask ourselves. Well, how did Jesus demonstrate to us that we are to lead those that he loved? Because it says, to love as he loved. He sat and ate with sinners, which would be your co-workers, your, your friends, your acquaintances, those that you're allowing your water to st spill over to, to overflow. He spent significant time with and poured into and served the disciples, which for us would be the equivalent of our family. Yet also he spent time and he went away by himself and spent time before the Lord seeking and prayer and, and his guidance and direction. This was demonstrating for us the importance of his personal time with the Lord. It's essential for us that we follow his pattern. Ephesians 25, 525, once again, says, Husband, loves your wife, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. If Christ is the model for us to imitate, how did he love the church? What did that look like? Well, 
let's see. He left his throne room and came as a helpless babe, born in a filthy barn, totally relying on a teenage outcast, was constantly challenged and confronted, loved by many when he was healing and feeding them. Oh, yes, Jesus, we love you. We adore you. Thank you for feeding us. Thank you for healing me. But as soon as it got tough, he was loved only by a few. He was beaten, slapped, spit upon, hung naked on a cross for six hours, and finally gave his life for the salvation of a church that denies him, constantly turns their back on him, questions his motives, blames him for tragedy, and forgets about him in triumph. This is how we are to love our wives. Unconditionally. Not if she makes sure the house is clean and the dishes are done and when you walk through the door, there's a meal on the table. Not if she is doing all the things, saying all the things and making you feel good for all your words, people. Not if she's buying you gifts for all the gifts, people. We love unconditionally. When we do that, here's the key. And I said it in jest, wives submit, and you know, I said that as a joke, but what, here, watch this, guys. You want her to, re- husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. You want her to respect you? You want her to submit to you? Cherish her. And when we do that, she'll have no issue submitting to you because you hold her in highest regard above all else. Esteem her as the precious gift that she is. And the third leg of your tripod. The Lord gave me an example this week of our lives as a, of a tripod. Many times we try to go through this life on our own. Tend to get tend to be a little unstable in all of our ways. Things come along and we fall over because we're men, we're strong, we can do it on our own, but as soon as something comes along, we get rocked and get knocked over. Many of us say, well, you know, I'm trusting the Lord, that's good. The Lord is my strength. And that's great. We need to do that. We're more stable than us. I can't, not easily as pushed around, moved. But I will tell you, and this goes for husbands and wives, that we also need our spouse that the Lord has given to us to bring that balance. And how do we do that? How do we become that third leg of the tripod to support and to be there, be there for one another. Cherish the things that they cherish, even if it's something that you're not really interested in, but they are. So find value in it because they do. That's a challenge sometimes with the kids, right? Guys, we talked about that at men's group. It's a, it's a challenge for me at times when my boys are so into video games, I, I frankly despise them have no time for them, didn't play them as a kid, never played them as an adult. Don't interest me at all. Frankly, I feel like they're a colossal waste of time. (laughs) But I do know and recognize that a lot of people like them. And I'm sure there are things that I do that it's a colossal waste of time. (laughs) And you think is utterly ridiculous and stupid. So I've gone in there and I try and I sit there and Watch Aiden playing Fortnite and taking an axe and chopping down pallets, <laughs> moving around and hiding behind things and giving me a headache because the screen's going all over the place. I've never felt older. <laughs> but it, it's interesting to him. So I attempt to express interest in it. <laughs> <laughs> I said attempt. (laughs) But with our spouse, are you their champion? Are you supporting them in their endeavors? Even if you don't necessarily think that it's something that you would do, but if they are passionate about it and you guys are prayed about it and you feel this is the direction of the Lord for us, are you supporting them? Are Are you their greatest 
champion? Are you your greatest fan? Are you the one that's shouting out to the world, this is what they're doing, and I support them in that? Stability. When we're there for each other. Supporting one another. If your spouse has aspirations of breeding dogs and having a dozen puppies in your home, do you just smile and say, sure, that would be fantastic. (laughs) I definitely wanted one dog. I certainly want 13 in my home. (laughs) Please do it multiple times. Oh, yes. You want to keep one of them so so we can breed them alternately throughout the year? Yes. Let's do this. I'm your biggest fan. (laughs) One way to think about this is through the lens of Christ. Occupying the roles of prophet, priest, and king for the church. This tripod is going to serve a dual role for us today. Being the priest of the home, you will serve as prophet, or be the spiritual leader, excuse me, of the home, you'll serve as priest, and you will serve as king. Not that your children and your spouse are serving you. You're going to see, we're going to see here as we look to the Lord as our example of what those, each of those mean, you'll find as you want all of the accolade, you'll find the responsibility is so great, you may not want to be focused on accolade. It's a tremendous responsibility. Let's look at role of prophet first. At the heart of every, the life of a prophet, he's commit, committed to listening to the Lord and then sharing it and speaking it to the people. That was the role of a prophet. For us as men, we need to be a prophet to our families. That means proclaiming and living out the gospel of grace to them. It means prioritizing time to listen to the Lord through Bible study, devotions, sound teaching, and wise counsel from Christian friends. If you, not, if you haven't intentionally built into your life the opportunities to hear from the Lord's voice through these practices, you can't possibly be a prophet to your family. Commit to adjusting your daily routine starting right now. So you can make time to listen to the Lord. Only then will you be prepared to have spiritually intimate conversations with your wife and your children and share what God is teaching to all of them. Role of priest. While the prophet represented God to the people, the priest represented the people back to the Lord. In the Old Testament, a priest would turn his back to them and mediate on their behalf. And they would go through once a year. We talked, Pastor alluded to it last week. We're going to be through a portion of October and into November. We're going to be spending a significant amount of time talking about the tabernacle. If you don't know anything about that, it's tremendous. It is rich with information. But one of those things is that once a year on the Day of Atonement, they would go into the holy, most holy place and they would give... They would uh, give a sacrifice on the, in the most holy place. Talked about it before. But what they would do is they would go before the Lord on behalf of the people once a year. And their sins were atoned for again. But they'd have to do it the next year. The great thing is when our, the precious lamb of Jesus Christ was slain, we know that the veil was rent. We know that he not only atoned for us, but he redeemed us. There's no more record of that wrong anymore. But he would turn his back on the people and he would mediate on their behalf before God. Jesus, of course, as we know, is our great high priest. And he mediates between us and the Father. And as Christians, we no longer have to have, go to a human individual, a mediator, who would therefore then go to the Lord. It's now Jesus as our great mediator. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. Once again, looking to Jesus for our example. Hebrews chapter 4, looking at verse 14, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest 
who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us lay hold of our confession. You know, in the Old Testament, the high priest would pass through the outer court, and we're going to get into all these things, if you know what that means. They'll be in the holy place every single day. And on the Day of Atonement, like we talked about, they would pass through the veil into the most holy place. Our great high priest, as we see here in verse 14, he passed through the heavens and came as a babe born in a manger. Jesus, the Son of God, let us lay hold of our confession. The great thing is, is that he didn't stay a babe. He grew up to be a tremendous man, but that's not the only thing he did. He didn't just come and tell his great stories and, and heal people and feed them, and that was it. He actually did what he came here to do. His sole purpose in coming was so that he might give life and life more abundantly. So he is crucified, as we all know. He was rose, risen on the third day, and now he sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And if we said on some occasions, sometimes he even stands up. I love the picture of that. Verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who, priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but it was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We've shared this verse on many occasions. I love the fact that he is tempted like as we are. He can recognize, he can sympathize, he can empathize with our weaknesses. He's been there before. He is touched, says another passage, he is touched by the feelings of our infirmities. We mentioned, talked about in, in several occasions back in the Gospels that he was moved with compassion. The things that you're going through in your life, he sees it, he knows it, and he is moved with compassion based on what you're going through. Verse 16, because of this, because of the fact that we have this great high priest, because of the fact that he is tempted in all points, yet without sin, let us therefore come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We can come boldly before him. We don't have to be sheepish and, and worried about what he's going to do or, or, or what's going to happen to us or what he's going to say. We can come boldly before him and say, Lord, I, I made a mistake. I blew it again. I repent before you. Wash me. Make me clean whiter than snow. Hur purge me with hyssop. We can come boldly. You know, when kids are younger, they... They come boldly into your room. They come boldly into the kitchen. They, they just come boldly, right? Everything is boldly. But as they get older, then they get a little more sheepish. It didn't like to be funny when we're driving in the car. I'll move my hand to do whatever, and he always goes like this. He flinches like I punch him or something on a regular occasion, only once or twice. <laughs> but he does this all the time. He's like, Ooh! you know, like I'm going to do something to him. That's not how we have to be with the Lord. We don't have to worry about going there and worry about we're going to get backhanded. We can come before him and know that he sees us through the blood of Jesus. He isn't standing there just waiting with a big sledgehammer to smash us. No, he won't draw iniquity to his side. So we are to when we fall in short, and we will, and you have, and so have I, and you will again, and so will I. But our purposing is to follow him with all that we have. And when we do fall short, when we do, flat out call what it is, when we sin, not a word we hear too much in church very often anymore, when we sin, that he is faithful and just to forgive of all unrighteousness. I guess it's kind of a, I'm getting what I deserve with Adam doing this flinching thing. I told him when I was probably close to his age, my parents never turned on the air conditioning, and even when I was 197, 
they always had their windows open. And so <laughs> I used to, I'm so glad they're not here today. I used to take my belt. I'm not condoning this. I'm just saying reaping and sowing. That's what I'm doing. I, I am now reaping what I sowed as a kid. I would take my belt and I would slam it on my bed and I'd be like, I'm sorry. Don't beat me. And I'd go, it'd be like, bam. I'm sorry, I won't spill my milk anymore. Please don't do that again. I'm sorry. And then my mom would be like, will you stop it? Will you stop doing that? Then she realized she would hear in between the, whoosh, the neighbors would hear, will you stop yelling? Will you stop doing that? So she's like, she would just shut my door and leave. She's like, it's worse for me yelling because now they're hearing this slapping of the belt and then they're yelling all at the same time. Now, mind you, I mentioned that the no air conditioning, that mean, meant all the windows were open, right? Reaping and sowing. Now I, I'm getting what I, there's the flinch. <laughs> Oh, boy. Okay. Verse 16, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Obtain mercy. That word obtain means to take, receive, and lay hold of like a gift. I love the fact that we can lay hold of his mercies. It says his mercies are new every morning. And we can find grace to help in time of need. Have you ever been in a time of need? You needed his grace? Needed his help. Yeah. We can use this as a model as spiritual leaders of our home. Through fervent prayer, we get the sacred opportunity to go to the Lord on behalf of our loved ones. Not only on the behalf of our wife and children, but our friends and our extended family as well. Are you leading them toward a grace-based relationship with the Lord or away from one? There are several practical things that we can be doing. First, if you haven't already, be an, adv be an advocate for you and your family to get connected here in this house with this family in regular attendance. Make it a priority in your home. Let it be the standard as you get up on Sundays that they're not asking, are we going to church today? There's no question. We're getting up. We're taking a bath on Saturday night because we have church tomorrow. Right, Mom? Right, Dad? Absolutely. Make it the standard in your home. When someone in your family has questions or problems, get in the habit of going to Scripture together with them for wisdom. Let your first thought, let it be your first thought, not an afterthought. Don't sit there and try to figure out everything they should probably do and then go, oh, wait, you know what? Maybe we should probably check Scripture. Let it be the first thing that you look to and allow the Lord to be able to speak. Pray for the fruit of the Spirit, which is in Galatians 5, and 23, which read that. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Pray for those fruits to be wrought in your life, to be increasingly evident so that you can model integrity and grace in your daily interactions with your wife and your children. Leading by example is the most powerful way to lead. Secondly, a, to provide. First, to lead. Second, to provide. Are you striving to provide for the needs of your family? On the most basic level, this means to work diligently to ensure that they have enough food and a safe place to live. But not only that, but providing stability that goes far beyond their physical needs. Do your children know that you love them unconditionally? Do you let them know that there is nothing you can do or say that would ever change the way that I love you? Now, I may not appreciate something that you do, but there's never going to be a time that's going to change the way that I love you. That sounds kind of like the Lord's unconditional love for us. Once again, looking to Him as our example.
Do they feel safe and secure around you? Do you administer discipline with fairness? Do you treat your wife with consideration and respect? Are you quick to forgive and overlook offenses? Do you apologize when needed? Do you love her like Christ loved the church? This kind of emotional provision is just as important as physical provision. Now, I want to take a moment to pause with this topic in mind, and I know that there are, we're going to pray here in just one second. There are many of you here, not only here today, but also that are listening and are watching online and live and will watch later on, that are facing things with work. And whether or not, and they're require, some places are requiring for you to either get a shot, not a shot, whatever it is. And I'm not here to tell you what to do about that. But you just ask the Lord what direction that you're supposed to be in. However, what I am going to do is pray for wisdom for you. Because there are some of us that will be facing a decision. And so here's the great thing about it. One thing that we don't ever want to do, if you choose that you say, you know what, that's something that we've decided we don't want to do. I don't want you ever to do it out of fear that you're going to be concerned that you'll lose your job because you won't be able to provide for your family. Because we serve Jehovah Jireh. He's our source. It's not Ford. It's not your company, whatever you work for. He is our provider. That's just a vehicle that he's chosen to allow us to be able to work with. And many of you and us will be facing some serious decisions over the next coming weeks if things continue the way that they are leading right now. So Lord, we just do pray right now for your peace in our hearts, O oh God. Lord, we pray for wisdom in this situation. Lord, we thank you that we have somewhere to turn. We have somewhere to run. We can run and run into your righteous tower, O oh God, and be safe. So Lord, we thank you that we serve you all the days of our life and that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. So Lord, we put our total trust in you. Lord, for not only everything, but more specifically for this situation. Those that are facing choices, either they have to get a shot or you don't have a job here any longer. So Lord, speak to their hearts and what direction that you have for them. Or we don't want man's wisdom. We don't want something we read on Facebook. We don't want something we read here on the news. Lord, we want your wisdom in this situation. Lord, so speak to each heart. And through all of that, Lord, bring peace. Holy Spirit, Prince of Peace, come and brood over each house where this is coming and the choice is being forced upon them. Lord, Cause them to know that you are with them, that you'll walk them through this, that you may even have something even better for them. So we thank you for that, oh God. We thank you for protecting this house. We thank you, Lord, that sickness is not welcome here. We thank you, Lord, that we apply the blood of Jesus over the, the doorposts of this house and each individual house. Lord, that the, when the enemy comes, he sees the blood and has to pass over to go to the next one. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name. As the priest of the home, that is one of our most important responsibilities to understand what I just prayed about, and that is applying the blood of Jesus over our home. We don't have to physically do that any longer. That's something they did back in the Old Testament, but we can pray that the Lord's protection, hedge of protection, that we, as we will apply the blood of Jesus over our home. The enemy, guys, here's the thing. The enemy knows the power in the blood of Jesus as well, and he has to pass over your home when we apply that as a priest of the home, that we pray over our home, we pray for protection. He has to go and jump over to the next one. He's got to go to your neighbor, or if, they, if they're applying the blood too, he's got to keep on going until he finds someone that hasn't done that. He has no right into your home when we have pled the blood of Jesus over it. 
So I would encourage you, if you've never done that before, to do so. That is one of the major roles of your, as being a spiritual leader of the home to do over your house. Because he has no right to you or your family or anyone else living in your home. In Jesus' name. Provision. Thirdly, to protect. There are very few men who wouldn't die for their family in order to protect them if needed. But beyond protecting them from literal death, there are many practical things that we can do in our daily lives to protect them from temptation and all kinds of danger. As a spiritual leader in our home, consider what you watch on your television. As a father, do you have channels that your children can access that would do harm to them? Do you have apps on your phone that would do the same? Do you know what apps are on their phones and who it is that they're chatting with and spending time with, even on their games or whatever it is in some type of chat communication? Do you know your kids' friends, where they are when they're not home? Do you have the stalker app installed on their phone so you can look at GPS to find out exactly where they are at any moment in time? Absolutely. Do they have clear boundaries? As a husband, do you watch things that could potentially hinder your relationship with your wife? Does your wife have full access to your phone and if requested and vice versa? It's not just us, ladies. Does she feel protected and cared for consistently? That's the key, guys. We joke about Ephesians, and wives submit, but when she feels protected and cared for, she has no trouble, none whatsoever, recognizing you as a spiritual leader. That's exactly what she wants you to be. No matter if you have the strongest of strong wives or the meekest, she still desires you to be the priest of your home. When thinking about a king, it's helpful for us to view our roles through the lens. If Jesus, the king of kings, can humble himself as a servant, how much more should we devote ourselves to serving our family in humility? So, some keys to becoming a spiritual leader as we close. As you're listening to this role of prophet, priest, and king, you may recognize immediately that you aren't any of them. You aren't there yet, and that's okay. But you have to start somewhere, and I encourage you to start today. What you can do and start heading this direction, is there something that you need to repent from? Is there something you need to surrender before you can earnestly begin growing in your role as a spiritual leader, no matter where you are starting from today, His grace is sufficient for you. As it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, His grace is sufficient. Rely on Him and reach out to other brothers in Christ for counsel and encouragement whenever needed. This isn't something that we need to muscle our way through and try to do on our own through a tremendous amount of effort. But let's face it, loving our wives as Christ loved the church is a pretty tall order. But notice here the rest of the verse. It says, husband, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's the key. That's how we are to love them. Think, how did the Lord love the church? What are all the things that he did? What are all the things he was willing to do? And that's how we are to love our spouse. The church means everything to Jesus. He sacrificed everything for her. 
In order to be a priest of the home, we need to be willing to give ourselves up for our families, our selfish desires, our preferences, our conveniences, our attention, all of it. And this is the first step to being the priest of your home. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you for these reminders today. Regardless of where we are in our relationships, if we're at the very beginning, we're, we've been in this for 50 years, somewhere in between. Lord, we thank you that we can turn to you for our example more than anything, oh God. Help us to look to your word. Lord, speak to our, search our hearts, as it says in Psalms. Lord, see if there are things that are not pleasing in your sight. Lord, convict us of those by your Holy Spirit. Lord, cause us to be willing to surrender and give those things up so that we can be and walk in the purposing that you have for us, O oh God. That we can be that priest of the home as you've designed us to be. Lord, we thank you for these reminders. We thank you for these words today. Lord, we ask that throughout the week, Lord, you continue to speak to us. Lord, can give us a, a thirst and a hunger for your word, O oh God. Lord, reveal, make it alive to us so that when we dig into it, so that we can share with our family, Lord, it's, it's real and it's alive to us. By your Holy Spirit, Lord, quicken this word. Yes. In our time of prayer, Lord, we, we know that you're speaking. Lord, give us ears to, to listen, to hear what you're saying. You're faithful. You're worthy today, oh God. We love you. Yes. We pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Can you say amen? Have a great week. You're loved.